Joining us now on the line from Edmonton, Alberta, Conrad Fassbender. He is Assistant Professor of Palliative Medicine at the University of Alberta. And Conrad, it's good to have you on the line. How are you tonight? I'm uh, very good. Uh, thank you, Steve. Glad to hear it. Let's start with this. We know that, for example, in the province of Ontario, health care spending accounts for almost half of all program spending in the Ontario budget. But I want to start by narrowing in that health care expenditure just on the last six months of people's lives. Any idea what percentage of our health care spending we do that focuses on people who are, you know, to put it, to put it delicately, are basically waiting to die in the last six months of their life? Right. Uh, so first, uh, I should say there are a couple of different ways of measuring uh, those costs. You can say that 1% of the population is responsible for 20% of the health care costs in their last six months of life and that uh, came from a study in Manitoba. Alternatively, you could say that approximately a quarter, 25% of those costs uh, occur, of all healthcare costs occur looking after people in their last year of life. Hmm. Let's break it down a little further then. You study the costs associated with the last two years of life. How much more does a patient cost the healthcare system in the last year of his or her life compared to the second last year of his or her life? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, it varies uh, from uh, around 10 times to 40 times as much uh, in their last year of life as compared to the second last year of life. And uh, even a little more if you compare to uh, healthy people or the general population. Now do you come to any conclusions as to whether or not you think this is an appropriate expenditure? Well, that's a, good, that's a good question and it's very difficult to answer. It's difficult to answer because the costs in the last year of life are used to do two things. They're used to um, keep people alive. So at the time when you're first diagnosed with a terminal illness or when you're first, uh, 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 when you go into an, um, uh, an emergency room or an ICU, we use technologies and those are very expensive. And the intent of those technologies is to keep you alive. Uh, at a certain point in time when death is inevitable, um, the patient, the family, the caregivers and uh, the healthcare system shifts focus and focuses on maintaining comfort and dignity of care for that person. So that last year of life, the costs really do two different things. Let's tackle some more conventional wisdom here. The conventional wisdom, I think, is that people who need treatment for cancer in the healthcare system are taking up a huge amount of the expenditure. Is that in fact the case? Um, well, it's, uh, it's correct to say that about 30% of people that die have a diagnosis of cancer. And uh, it's also true to say that in the last year of life, cancer patients um, cost the healthcare system approximately $40,000. Um, the, the problem is that we know that when we look backwards. So at the time of death, it's very easy to say how much someone has cost. The problem that the healthcare system uh, uh, the, uh, faces and, and the problem that the patients and the doctors have is at the time when they're in the office or in the hospital bed, we don't know how long they will live. And also we don't know, in many cases, the outcomes of treatment. So uh, because of those uncertainties, uh, we can't say for certain um, when someone will die and because of that, uh, even if we could, it, it may not be, it will, would not be ethical to say we will withhold treatment because, uh, because of that. It's uh, not generally accepted. Um, you broke down the causes of death and the expenditures associated with them into four areas and I want to just go through those briefly right now. Here are what we're calling the economics of death, the yearly costs of dying. If you die from organ failure, as you said, it's almost $40,000. If it's a terminal illness, just over $36,000. If one dies from what's being called frailty, which I presume is associated with old age and so on, 31,000 mm -hmm. plus. And then sudden death, a heart attack, for example, just $10,000 plus. Now let's go through some of the costs associated with each type of, this, uh, of these illnesses. Why, for example, would dying from organ failure be four times as expensive as dying from a heart attack right away? 
Good, uh, uh, good question. So the sudden death categories uh, include people, for example, that uh, if you have a heart attack uh, and outside of a hospital and uh, if you don't receive treatment in time, in fact, uh, you are quite inexpensive uh, to the healthcare system. If uh, you have um, congestive heart failure uh, or more extensive heart disease, uh, those costs will uh, accumulate because you spend uh, a lot of time in the hospital. But if you're, let's say you're having a heart attack and you need to be immediately under emergency situation, heart bypass, for example, and you die on the table, I mean, you would think that's a fairly expensive procedure and therefore it would cost the healthcare system more. You're saying that's not the case? Well, appro approximately, uh, we've categorized 10% 10 10 of the uh, individuals who die as sudden death, and um, that's comprised not only of heart attack, but it's uh, comprised of uh, um, all unexpected and sudden deaths. So some of those individuals, uh, for example, uh, you might be um, elderly and die in your sleep, uh, you might get hit by a car, or you might have a heart attack, and we take all of those individuals and we average uh, their costs together. Whereas organ failure, um, these are uh, chronic diseases that involve uh, 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 the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, and so forth. And um, technologically, they're more complicated to treat, and treatment takes years. And uh, every time you go into the hospital, um, those lengths of stay get longer, and uh, the chance of dying becomes greater. So at the time of death, organ failure is quite expensive and as compared to sudden death. Understood. Okay, Conrad, so far we've been talking mostly about uh, costs to the state, if you like, or to the taxpayer. I want to switch our conversation now to personal costs. And in Canada, where we have Medicare, we may think of health care as being a more public type of expenditure, but the fact is, I guess, um, there is a personal financial burden to dying, if I can put it that way. Uh, could you go into that a little bit and tell us what some of the personal, as opposed to uh, public costs are, to dying? Uh, certainly, we live in a publicly funded healthcare system, but uh, what you need to realize is that those are 70% of the total healthcare costs. So, um, Statistics Canada and the Canadian Institutes for Health Information uh, conduct surveys and uh, determine that uh, um, the costs of public care, which uh, include pri predominantly hospitals and physicians, uh, if you add those to what we pay for out of pocket, so all of the expenses when you go to the pharmacy, uh, when you go uh, and uh, purchase supplies, uh, uh, aids to uh, daily living, wheelchairs, walkers, um, it may include uh, dietary supplements, it may include modifications to your home uh, because of limitations in your physical ability, uh, IV poles, uh, and the list goes on. So there are a number of expenses um, that on average for across uh, the population uh, is 30 percent. 30 percent of, uh, oh, 30 percent of the total. total cost. Okay. You know, of course, that uh, sometimes we Canadians suffer from a bit of a superiority complex when it comes to uh, our health care system versus the United States. And the stories we hear out of the States frequently are that people have to go into personal bankruptcy or they have to lose their home or remortgage their home in order to pay for their health care costs. And my question is, does that happen in this country? Uh, it, it happens, but not in the same way. So in the, in the United States, um, there's a phenomenon called asset spend down, which means uh, in order to qualify for Medicaid or for uh, uh, publicly funded health care services, um, the requirement is that you cannot own assets. So if you own a house, um, you would not qualify, for example. Uh, whereas in Canada, we don't have those uh, requirements. However, because the personal costs um, typically are in the tens of thousands of dollars, what happens uh, is that um, the seniors and their caregivers and families do exhaust uh, their financial resources. So the same phenomenon occurs, and we know, uh, looking at uh, some of the numbers uh, uh, in, in Alberta, that uh, for, for cancer patients, that 50% of cancer patients at the time of death are uh, classified as being in poverty, and that's certainly a higher proportion uh, than individuals uh, who are diagnosed uh, with cancer. Okay, this is interesting, because I think this will come as news to a lot of people. 
I get asked frequently by Americans, for example, uh, who may email me or bump into me on the street, they will say, you know, we hear great things about your health care system insofar as no one loses their house here in order to pay for their health care. You're saying that's not the case. Am I reading you right? Well, uh, you might not uh, lose the house, but uh, you will lose some equity in your house and uh, certainly your caregivers uh, will lose uh, employment income uh, while they look after you. So the experience of of dying and of caring for dying individuals uh, is financially uh, straining and uh, it's uh, uh, clinicians in the healthcare system uh, are frequently uh, dealing with patients and uh, their families uh, on this issue and uh, it's a very important issue. Well you brought up caregivers so let me follow up on that. You talked a moment ago that it it could cost tens of thousands of dollars quote unquote to die in this country your own personal expenditures versus those of the healthcare system. How about, we know, we know, and you've just said it, that caregivers themselves, you know, daughter taking care of elderly parents, for example, who are in the process of dying, we know that costs them money too. Any idea how much on average? Well, uh, in, so in, in economic terms, we refer uh, to those costs as uh, indirect costs. And indirect costs are costs which uh, have a value but for which um, money is not exchanged. So as you know, many of the caregivers uh, may be uh, retired, they may be housewives, they may be students. And so uh, we have a tendency to say that uh, there isn't a cost associated with that care. Whereas if I take time off work or if uh, a caregiver takes time off work to look after the uh, family, uh, we tend to uh, identify with those costs more readily. And so there's a couple of different categories of costs. If you take the value of all of that time together, the value of that time is equivalent to the public health care system. And so a nice way of looking at it is that the public health care system and the caregivers um, uh, work as equal partners in, in looking after the, the dying. Okay, you. let's finish up on this then. We know you've told us in good detail here about the costs associated with dying. D d does the provincial or federal government, uh, do provincial, does the federal government have in place uh, programs that are designed to presumably financially assist people who are dealing with a dying parent, spouse, child, whatever? Uh, yes, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are some uh, programs uh, that are available. Uh, there's uh, Senator Carstairs has uh, been a very strong advocate and, uh, ha and uh, has uh, championed uh, caregiver legislation which for example uh, provides uh, employment insurance benefits uh, to caregivers uh, for a limited uh, amount of time. Um, the problem with uh, that program however is that the, uh, those benefits may not be uh, fully utilized because again uh, they're limited in time and it's difficult to know when a patient will die. And speaking of end of life care, if a doctor gives you a note saying I'm sorry, but uh, here it is in black and white. Your spouse has got six months to live. What are you eligible for under those circumstances? Um, there are palliative uh, care uh, uh, drug programs. Uh, so for, uh, in uh, uh, many, if not uh, most of the provinces, uh, which uh, do allow uh, uh, for increased uh, drug uh, coverage. And so that does uh, provide uh, some benefit. And just final question here, do you think not on the private care, uh, not on the private expenditure side this time, back into the public uh, system. Do people, because it's quote unquote not their own money, they think health care is free, so to speak, we pay th through our taxes for it, do they yeah. take into account in these last months of grandma or mom or dad's life how much taxpayer money they are spending in order to have that last six months of life? Do you see that as being a part of uh, the public's thinking when they consider these issues, or if they consider these issues? Well, there's certainly a debate uh, that's taking place now whether uh, uh, we should be aware of those costs. And uh, I would say that, uh, in fact, um, we need to look at the debate in a broader context. And so, for example, um, when you wake up in the morning, you've turned the light switch on, uh, you might uh, call into your office or turn on a radio and television and then after breakfast you go into your car and, and drive to work. And at no point in time 
Uh, do you have any doubt that that light switch will turn on, um, that uh, the roadways uh, aren't maintained properly, or that the telecommunications uh, systems uh, will let you down? That's a public expectation. And yet, for some reason, in healthcare, um, we impose this, addi this um, additional burden of knowledge uh, where we need to be aware of these costs and we need to maintain them and we're worried about their sustainability. So I would, uh, I would recommend that we um, look at the context of healthcare costs in a, in a broader framework. Gotcha. Conrad Fassbender, it's good of you to join us on the line from Edmonton, Alberta tonight. Thanks so much. Well, Steve, thank you very much.